were on last week. Um, so a quick recap and then we'll finish it and then go on to this week's as well. Um, as you can see, it was taken from Mark chapter 7 where Christ confronts the religious leaders of that time. And one of the things that we kind of looked at was um, religion versus a relationship and legal, legalism versus liberty or freedom. Go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, obviously we introduced that and then we looked at confrontation and asked the question really, is it right to confront people? We see Christ doing this because the religious leaders of that time sadly some today as well but the religious leaders of that time were actually concentrating on a lot of the pharisaical rules and regulations that they had made up not for biblical um, terms, but ones that they had added on to the established laws, if you like, that God had given Moses. And they started piling them on on top of that. And then one of these was in terms of ceremonial cleansing or ceremonial washing. In other words, you couldn't eat or go into the temple or anything like that before you had washed your hands, etc., washed the instruments that you were going to use in a certain way. It had to be a certain way um, that that was done. And there was a complaint from the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious leaders at that time, saying basically that how could Jesus be a man of God, how could Jesus be the Messiah if he was sitting with sinners? if he was sitting with people who they would have classed as unclean, in other words. And of course that brings up a whole lot of dimensions. And what Jesus said to them was, Moses says this, but you say this. And there's a big difference there. Because we need to adhere to what Scripture says, not what our own rules were uh, in that sense, if we go on to the next. And then we see that um, Christ condemns them. He condemns their actions, but the way that he do he, the way that he does that is through using scripture. And he used um, a passage from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one where it actually prophesies what these guys were actually doing. The interesting thing about that is that these men were read up and scholars of the Old Testament, so they should have been aware of passages like this. But although, and I think this is one of the beauties of Christ, one of the beauties of God, um, although God does say what they're doing is wrong and condemns that, then he goes on to say at the end of chapter 1, look, why don't, you, why don't we just come and sit down and speak about it? Why don't we just come and have a chat? And let's get it sorted out. Because it's more important in sorting it out than actually the, the condemning of it. And then if we nip on to the next slide. And this is where we kind of left it last week. <coughs> Again, I suppose we need to ask the question, um, how does this to apply to us in a day in which we live? Is it, is it proper? Is it political correct? Um, for a religious point of view, for a Christian point of view, is it correct to... Um, see something and deal with that issue. Confront it and then once you've confronted it then you can correct it as well. And we need to look at that and we need to discuss that as well. But again we always come back to the fact I think that it's still about relationship and not religion. 
is still about freedom or liberty rather than legalism. We saw how Christ had actually said, look, yes, you worship me. You come to a temple um, and you worship me with your lips. You may even pray. Um, you may take uh, the sacraments, etc., etc. But in actual fact, your hearts is a mile away from me. And sadly, I find even in today's society, um, we can see that there are people who fall into that category. Yes, they might turn up each week for church. They might pray. They might sing worship songs. They might even take the bread and the wine. And yet their hearts are a mile away from Christ. And it's really our hearts that we should be focusing on. There's that story, I can't recall exactly where it is, but there's that story in the New Testament where the religious leader goes up to pray. And, if you like, the sinner goes up to pray. And when you look at the two prayers, the religious leader, his prayer is very eloquent. He does all the proper things that you're supposed to do when you come in public and pray. He makes sure that everybody hears his prayer, um, and so the list goes on. And yet there's a wee guy at the side, and he basically goes up, and he comes before God and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. And that's all he says. And Christ saying, you know, look at these two prayers. Which one is from the heart? Or what one is in religious terms? So let's take a scenario that somebody you know, or you might not even know them, but someday you might know falls into sin. They might slip up for whatever reason and they might fall into sin. Do we as believers, as Christians, just let that lie? And say, well, you know, it happens, it's okay. Or do we confront that? And after confronting it, do we try and correct it? And that is a big, big question. I must admit, um, before we go any further, if we do correct it or try to correct it, if we do confront it, it is one of the hardest things to do. I must admit that. Um, and it can be very, very difficult. But in... Second Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 25, it says this, Correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And it's that we part of that sentence at the beginning, I think so, so important. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. You know, there's a way to do it. If we are going to confront somebody who has fallen away, or maybe somebody who we don't even maybe adhere to what they think, or adhere to their religion, then we do it with gentleness. It is so easy to do it in a judgmental fashion, and come down really, really hard on it. Listen, I've seen it done, and I've seen how it doesn't work. It can chase folk a mile away. But we see from Christ's example, and as I all go back to that in chapter 1, where it says, where Jesus says, look, let's just, have a, let's just have a wee chat. Let's go for a coffee to Starbucks, and let's just have a wee chat about what's happened. Doing it with gentleness. Doing it with kindness. Can you imagine confronting, as I say, someone you know who has sinned 
Uh, yep, yeah, that is difficult, eh? It is difficult. And normally there is a bit of a fallout as well. But listen to what it says in James chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So we ask the question again, is it proper to confront? Is it proper to try and correct? Look what we can do, or look what we're doing when we do this in James 5. We bring back a sinner, first of all, from his wandering. And nine times out of ten, they're not actually happy where they are. But not only that, we save their soul from death. And then thirdly, on top of that, we also cover a multitude of sins. What a privilege it is for a believer. Can you imagine saving somebody's soul from certain death? For me, that is just absolutely amazing. And bringing them back from their wandering. And I've often wondered why it says that you'll cover a multitude of sins. You know, we don't go and broadcast what they've done. We don't go and broadcast and say, you know what, I was speaking to Fred um, on Saturday night and he has done all this horrendous stuff, but praise God, we've brought him back. No, you can cover these sins. You can cover maybe the embarrassment that's happened when a person has fallen away. We have got that ability as well. And, of course, as I said, when we correct people in that sense, then we realize that their heart is getting closer to God. And it goes from religion to a relationship. And it goes from being caught up in the bondage of legalism to having the freedom in worship. They start honoring God with their lips. Their heart is close to God and they worship God in a proper manner. You know, someone who is caught up in religion or legalism, we could put it this way and bring it up to date. We could say that they attend, they attend church but their heart is far from me. They read their Bible, but their heart is far from me. They pray eloquently, but their heart is far from me. They contribute money, but their heart is far from me. They do ministry, but their heart is far from me. They love to sing, but their heart is far from me. They talk to others about Jesus, but their heart is far from me. From me. You know how sad it is if their hearts have grown cold. And I really think as well, as we go along in our faith, as we journey in our faith, I think sometimes our own hearts can grow cold. So it can. And before we know it, we can drift. No intentionally, it can be unintentionally we can drift away from God. And in Proverbs 4, it says this, and I think this is a great passage as well, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity, keep corrupt talk far from your lips, let your eyes look straight ahead, Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet 
and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. A warning there in Proverbs 4, just to guard our hearts, because that is where everything really stems from. So let's keep guarding our hearts and don't be frightened to confront somebody. If you think that they have fallen, if you think they're doing things in a religious way rather than in a relationship, don't be frightened to say in a nice way. You don't do it in a judgmental way. But take them alongside you. And that's what discipleship is as well. Taking somebody alongside you and showing them what they can do to correct. I remember speaking to a lad and <clears throat> he um, had what you call backslidden for years. He was away from Christ for years and we we're just having a chat and he says to me, well you know when I was in the backslidden state it was the worst time of my life. It says, because I was trying to do things that people in the world would do. I was trying to go out to nightclubs. I was trying to go out to parties. I was going to the, to the um, bars, etc. It says, but I wasn't happy. Because I knew that's where I shouldn't be. And it says, actually, when I was in that no man's land, it was neither going out and it was neither going to church. It says that was pure torture. It says and it only became correct, it only became right, it only became a blessing when I came back to God, when he got his heart sorted. sorted. It says then, and only then, that's when I was really happy in myself. So let's keep guarding our hearts and try and work with folk. Because, as James says, if we do bring a sinner back, as it were, then we're saving their soul from death. Now, could we go on to this week's, Andrea, um, please? What's the last slide? I, that, the, the next week. You get my drift? That's last week's, as it were. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. That's us. There's only two slides, so you're okay. So we come to this week's, and um, again we're walking through Mark, and the title this week is What on Earth is Happening? Or What is Happening? And we'll take this from um, the Transfiguration. <clears throat> um, if we look at Mark chapter 9 we'll read the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 9 um, and it says there in regards to this amazing experience it says and after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. I think that must be the biggest understatement um, the scriptures, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. They were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came from the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them 
but Jesus only. Now as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to tell he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. <coughs> Excuse me. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. They asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does not come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and he did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So we see this amazing story in um, Mark, a story where um, Peter, James and John gets the privilege to go up into that mountain with Jesus and of course they witness more than one thing but the first thing that they witness is the fact that they see God's glory. We could spend a fair bit of time on this subject itself, the glory of God. But it's interesting that, again, if you do a study on it and you look at the experiences people have um, when the glory of God comes, then nine times out of ten they fall prostrate or fall on their knees or they get blinded or whatever it may be. Such is the power, if you like, such as the brightness of that glory. And I'm convinced that these guys, although it doesn't go into it in a lot of detail in Mark, in the other Gospels it goes into it in more detail, but I'm sure they must have wondered what on earth is happening. Now they may have read of Elijah, they may have read of Moses, but never seen him. And here they're standing on top of a mountain, and there's this mega, mega, mega bright light, like something they have never, ever seen before, and they witness Moses and Elijah. Now, if I was in their shoes, I would be certainly questioning what on earth is happening? You see, in one sense, we're doing this study actually in the Alpha at the moment. We're looking at <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. But when God's glory comes or the Holy Spirit comes, it may raise issues like that. I've often, I've often wondered at some of the revivals. Take the one up in Lewis and I've often wondered what people must have thought when that happened. Take the revivals that happened along this coast in the 20s and stuff like that where people were falling in the street begging for God's mercy. I am sure people must have asked the question what on earth is happening? Maybe we've had an experience like that ourselves and wondered what exactly is happening. I go back to the story um, that I read um, about the school um, up the Bray there. And I can't remember the evangelist's name, but there's an evangelist come to Per Gordon for a weekend's meetings, I think it was. And on the Friday night, there was nobody there. <clears throat> On the Saturday, there was hardly anybody there. And he said, oh, well, there's no point in having the Sunday service because I'm full of the cold, I've got the flu, nobody's coming, so what's the point of carrying on? I'm as well going home. But anyway, something told him to go and have that meeting. And it's recorded 
that he could hardly get into the building for people queuing up, crying for the mercy of God. You see, when things like this happen, when God's glory comes, we might not understand it. We might not realize actually what's happening. But one thing that we do know is that it's God that's behind it. And it should always be that. I'm sure in the in Lewis revival, I'm sure they asked what on earth is happening. I'm sure about the Whale, uh, Welsh revivals as well. They asked what on earth is happening. Because we can't always fathom God's glory. We might try. I suppose, in one sense, um, last year and even this year, when you see the sunset just out in the water there, and you're standing there looking at this tremendous sunset, or if you're fortunate enough to see the Northern Lights, but you're standing there seeing this amazing scene and actually, if we be honest, there is very limited words that we can use to try and describe what we've seen. We might say, oh, it's amazing, it's, it's awesome, it's magic, but these are words that we're trying to fit into something that we can't really, really describe because of the beauty of it. And that's a wee bit like God's glory. We've not got the words to try and explain away what we've actually saw. We read that with Mark in Mark's Gospel with Peter and, and James and John. The only thing they could compare it was to clothes being bleached. It was whiter than clothes that had been bleached. And, well, if you've seen bleached clothes, it's pretty white. But it was brighter than that. God's glory is an amazing thing. And if you've experienced a wee, bit of, a wee bit of it, then you'll know what I actually mean. But then we come to our next point, what um, is very important, I think, as well, because we see that Jesus' appearance changed. All of a sudden, he changed from one thing into another. And if we look at... <coughs> If we look at Isaiah chapter 53, and in one sense, and I hope you understand what I'm saying here, but in one sense, um, we see paintings of Jesus. And the artist's impression is of this really handsome guy um, and absolutely drop-dead gorgeous in one sense, and yet, if we read in Isaiah 53, this is what it says. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Jesus was just one of us as he walked down the street. And if we look at that reading, um, then we see that it says there is nothing actually about the appearance, the physical appearance of Jesus that we would be attracted to. In other words, he was just an ordinary guy. Just an ordinary man who you wouldn't turn your head at in a crowd in Argyle Street in Glasgow or Sucky Hall Street. He was just part of the crowd. Unless, of course, he was doing some of his miracles or teaching or something like that, then that would draw us to him. You would never expect God to be in the middle of a marketplace. You would never expect 
the divine, a divine being, <coughs> being to be in um, Elgin Main Street or Elgin Market or somewhere like that. And yet we read that Jesus walked these streets. And of course, as we know, Jesus was God himself. In other words, God was walking amongst the people. God was in the marketplace. God, were, God was in the high street. God was at the train station. God was in the places of employment. I think that's awesome. That's really awesome when we actually start to think, stop and think about that. That God himself, although there was nothing to attract us to him, God himself was actually walking around the crowds. He was mingling with the crowds of that day. And you know, the interesting thing is, we are God's representatives here on earth. We can bring God to people. We can bring Jesus to people. His identity was all of a sudden changed. In fact, even when he rode as the king of kings, as we'll see later on, as he rode into um, that town, he just rode on a donkey. Just an ordinary donkey. Now, I don't know um, if you've ever seen it, um, but if the queen comes or somebody of importance comes, certainly in these days you'd expect them to have an entourage the size of goodness knows what. They would have their horses, they would have folk walking in front of them, folk walking behind them, folk walking inside it, beside them, some um, important people may even be carried, and so the list goes on. And yet, the king of kings comes on a donkey. He rides in on a donkey. And I, I, I love this, somebody said it, I don't know who it was that said it, but I love this. He became who he was not, he became who he was not, that was man, without ever ceasing to be who he was. And that was God. So he became who, who he was not, man, without ever ceasing to be who he was. I thought that was a brilliant statement. In other words, yes, he became man. And it was man just like you and like me. He dressed just the same way as everybody else was dressed of that time. He did what everybody else did of that time. As we know, his life before it, he was a carpenter. And yet he never stopped being God. And I suppose in that, there is a lesson there for us as well. Because we are who we are. We do what we do. Whether we're still in, pro in employment, whether we're retired or whatever it might be, we are who we are. But we can take God to people. We can be God's representatives. The, the disciples were given a wee preview at this transfiguration, who Jesus really was. And they realized all of a sudden that Jesus was something else rather than who they thought he was. And of course, when history is finally wrapped up and the end of time comes, we too will get a glimpse of who Jesus really was. He was God and man. As we draw 
closer to Easter, as we draw closer to Jesus, as we draw closer to the cross, there is, there is always, or should be always, a change in us. You know, I know what I was like prior to being a Christian. I slipped away from Christ um, in my late teens, early twenties, so I did. And I know what I was like way back then. And I give God thanks that there is a change in me. But I pray for myself that that change will continue as I draw closer to not only Easter, but as I draw closer to Jesus and as I draw closer to the cross. Unfortunately, some Christians never move on. And yet, when we see change in others and we consider this transfiguration and the change that happened, as we move nearer through Lent, closer to Jesus and cross, let us no longer live as though we are bound in darkness. Let us no longer live as though there is no hope through Jesus, through his death on the cross and his resurrection. We are overcomers and victorious. Through Jesus, we can become overcomers and we come, can become victorious. There can be a change, a continuing change in a lie in our lives. Because you are alive, you are free. No longer is your past weighing you down. Those shackles are now broken. No longer are you dead in your sin but you're made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. Now you are heirs to Christ and children of a living God. I wonder, we can ask this question this morning. Do you see yourself in this way? Do you see yourself as someone who has overcome? Do you see yourself as someone who can and is victorious? No longer are you being weighed down or shackled by things that once held you. No longer are you being imprisoned by these things. Are you living as though nothing has changed? Are you living as though nothing has changed? We saw a massive change in Jesus when he was transfigured. We too, when we become Christians, when we become believers, I always say this and I, I don't apologize for, for saying it again. But <clears throat> I would say at least nine times out of ten, if not ten out of ten, when I've baptised somebody in adult baptism and believer's baptism, when they go into the water and come back out of the water, there is a change in them. Everybody's different, and everybody's change is different. But there is something physical that I can see that changes in them. Some are more obvious than others, but that's okay. But you see, when we have an experience like that, when we become believers, when we might be baptized as a believer, when we experience God's glory, God's divine glory, then there is always a change. He gives us a potential to live a life that overcomes. He gives us the potential to be victorious in our life. 
And all we need to do, in one sense, is simply grow closer to God. That's why I think Lent is so important, because it gives us that time just to grow closer to God, just to think about Jesus and what he did on that cross. But not only meet with Jesus and think about what he did on that cross, but on the third day he rose again, he defeated death, and that is an amazing thing. Let us keep reading the word of God. Let's keep meditating on it day and night. Let's keep having communion with God. Let us keep praying to God. Let's keep worshipping and opening, opening up our hearts to God. And if we do that, then we will draw closer to him. To finish up, James 4 verse 6 says this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Through the cross, everything has changed. We need to grab hold onto this truth and grow close to Christ. By doing so, we will be fulfilled, effective and productive in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who wouldn't want to draw close to God? Who wouldn't want to open their heart and their life to God? And as I said there earlier, for me that is what Lent is about. It's almost like kick-starting our faith again. Focusing on Easter. Focusing on what Christ did on that cross for us. He paid um, the ultimate price for my sin, for your sin. He rose again and defeated death. And because of that, we can have a victorious life. We're going to sing our final hymn, which I've forgotten what it's called. It's King of Kings, I think. Um, and we'll stand, those who are able, stand to sing King of Kings. Thank <clears throat> you.